Welcome to The Jewish Diasporist, a podcast focusing on the political, social, and cultural implications of life in diaspora. We are your hosts, Zach Smerin and Ben Yanowitz. This week we interviewed Habib Machul, a Palestinian citizen of Israel who I became friends with during my time in the UK, who recently completed a master's in public policy studying the particularities of his community's position within Palestine Israel. This is the first non-Jewish speaker we have invited onto our podcast. At this time, when many from our communities withdraw into their own echo chambers or join the bandwagon of spouting platitude-filled slogans, the importance of dialogue with those who share the universal values of equality, freedom, and justice for all is crucial. Even if we do not necessarily agree of everything said. If we are serious about building a peaceful future, we must seriously engage with the different historical narratives and the perspectives of all those who call this land their own. As of recording this at 10 p.m. Gaza time on October 24th, we are delighted to see that a small number of hostages have been released and hope that those remaining in captivity will soon see their freedom. That being said, we are also waiting in fear of the anticipated ground invasion by the Israeli army as we know that such an action will only cause further suffering for all involved, particularly for all those who lack access to water, electricity, sanitation, health care, and safe shelter. With thousands lost in the past few weeks, calls for an immediate ceasefire are a clear moral necessity, yet calls for peace alone lack substantive political content on their own. This may make them a good short-term demand. Because much of society should be able to support calls for immediate ceasefire, especially if the remaining hostages are released, or at least remain relatively well cared for, as one of those released, Yocheved Lifshitz, has described. But the peace we must call for cannot be merely a negative peace, the absence of violence. They must be a positive peace, the presence of real justice for all people that live between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. When we initially recorded this episode, we did not anticipate for the interview to need two parts. However, as we recorded for almost two hours and still didn't manage to cover everything I'd have liked to, such as his perspective on Palestinian-Israeli politics in the Knesset, as he interviewed the right-wing MK Mansour Abbas as part of his dissertation, to give this topic even remotely the attention and nuance it deserves, we have split this episode in two parts. Keep an eye out in the next week for part two of this provocative discussion. We'd also like to thank the talented Jewish diasporist artists Sol Weiss and Molly Bajgat for allowing us to include their beautiful and timely new song, Cross the Sea. We hope you enjoy. We won't rest till we're all free. You are not my enemy. In our pain and in our grief, border walls won't protect me. We will cross the sea with all of us or none. really nice to have you join us. Could you start by saying a little bit about yourself? My name is Habib Makhul. I am 29 years old. I just graduated with a master's for, with public policy from the University of York in the UK. I am from a small village called Jdeid al makir It's in what today is known northern Israel, very close to the city of Ak and Hefa. I'm very close to the Lebanese border as well. And I am a Palestinian. I identify and I'm ethnically a Palestinian, but I do have an Israeli citizenship. And I belong to this very special group called Palestinians or Arabs of 48, who are Palestinians that stayed, remained under Israeli rule, and then ended up getting citizenship. Today, comprising about 21% of the total Israeli population. Still part of the Palestinian diaspora, in my opinion. Unfortunately, because of a lot of different reasons, it has been separated significantly from the other Palestinian diaspora, whether it is internationally or in the West Bank in Gaza and East Jerusalem. But we are seeing somewhat of a revival. And at the same time, we are seeing the increased hostility from the state towards that. During my dissertation for my master's at York, I looked at crime and violence in my community, which has risen very significantly. Like today, if we were a country of our own, we would be among the top 30 violent countries in terms of murder rate in the world. Funny enough, just as the war started, the murder rate went significantly down. But now it's going back up, like two murders happened just yesterday. And this is all occurring under Israeli rule, under Israeli supervision, under the Israeli police. 
And in my dissertation, I wanted to look at these Israeli police stations and their efficiency in dealing with this. And what we find out is that these function more as mechanisms of control than actually just doing their job and policing the community as it should be. So for those of you who might not have figured this out by now, Habib and I met at the University of York, where we took a class together, which was on the critical theories of international political economy. But before that, we also got to know each other in the Marxist society. The Marxist society was essentially a front for socialist appeal, which was a Trotskyist group throughout the UK that I would say does play an interesting role within campus politics, but also a kind of problematic role in campus politics, because it's not really a student-run organization in the sense that the students who come to York's Marxist society run the organization and decide what they do. It's more of the central party organization of socialist appeal dictates to the leadership on campus what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. So it makes for a weird dynamic between the sort of organic conversations between left-wing people of different political persuasions and the very top-down party-line thinking of socialist appeal. So I was kind of wondering, Habib, could you say a little bit more about that and what your perspective was on that experience? Yeah, so obviously I was very lucky. For me, back in the my old university, I never had an opportunity. We didn't have societies, didn't have any of that. So it was a very lonely experience for most of my education in my undergrad. So coming in to this new kind of education was very refreshing. And obviously I already was mature enough and I know where my politics align and finding a Marxist society, you know, I jumped to the uh, occasion. I think the proof is in the pudding. I met some amazing people there. Tom who was with me as well in my degree. I met you there. I met a lot of amazing people and I learned a lot about topics that I've never thought about before from the French Revolution in 68 to actually having someone who's an actual Iranian talk about the point of view of an Iranian leftist and putting aside a lot of the Western propaganda. But yeah, sometimes having a centralized module is very frustrating considering where we come from. And I think the most frustrating thing, but this is York as a whole, is that you read about other universities in the UK which are way more militant in its activities. Manchester Manchester is the biggest example. They took buildings that they had to bring in the police. It connects to the Palestinian issue as well. If they are not doing anything to you, then you're probably doing it wrong. Let's just be honest. The protest that we saw, and obviously, again, proof is in the pudding, they already gave up. There was the UCU strike, and the UCU strike failed after way too long. Yeah, the strike has failed, in my opinion, because they signed a separate deal with the university after five years. I don't think they got any of the things they wanted. They just killed themselves for five years for what? Solidarity was very missing. Now we were there and a lot of the people from Social Appeal were there, but also a lot of them weren't. A lot of the days. I just think the militancy talk was there, but there was no actual action, but I can't blame them. One of the things that frustrates me the most, and this is also, I saw the Pierce Morgan interview with Basim Yusuf, and he said that in his opinion, the problem with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict is the lack of great leadership, which is, honest to God, I think at this point, it's just a fucking dumb argument. So what, are you supposed to wait for the Messiah? That is extremely depressing, disheartening, and it also feels like it disregards history. That's what I love about history, because it teaches you a lot. Are we the first ever occupied people on Earth? We are most certainly not. We are the longest so far. We hold records, but I don't think we were longest ever by any means. It's a very modern problem. Sometimes people have very short memories and they forget about it. The same thing I would say for any organization. We have means to change things. The question is, are we willing to risk it and take it? And it just feels like we were so privileged enough that we would not do those things. And I speak for myself. I would have probably have been hesitant because I had a visa and they basically threatened if you do anything. You could, I know of people who had scholarships who had to sign pledges not to participate in any protest whatsoever in the UK or they could risk their funding. So I can understand it's just York was such a disappointing thing. Yeah, I will say the militancy was very much not there, and I think what that organization really did was political education. Sure. And my big problem with the way they did political education was that they used what Paulo Freire called the banking model of education, which essentially means that 
each event each week they would have a person speaking for about half an hour yeah. to an audience that would just kind of sit there and absorb that information and they kind of treated the people that came to their meetings as if we didn't know anything already beforehand and as if we were like passive receptacles that they would just make deposits into and eventually we would all be good marxists with big scare quotes around yeah. and it was very much not the way left-wingers should be thinking about doing education because the way i think of left-wing politics is that it's the politics of creativity the politics of imagining what the world could be and then seeking to actually try to realize that vision and for them it was not that it was the politics of having a strict party line and trying to get that party line into everyone's throat so that we would just start regurgitating it sometimes it felt a bit too much i would say the worst example of this was in their event on fascism that was bad. could you say a little bit about that and how their view of fascism might contrast with your own Here's the thing. they only discussed economics and did not discuss a lot of the other aspects of fascism now here's the thing economics are crucially important because without them probably you wouldn't have a lot of the racist structures we have today i think it's an important analysis but you can't only base it on that because the thing is when a lot of these systems go away a lot of the elements especially the racism stays for a very long time and it's also like the first thing that you see race is an important tool because nobody talks about economics so i understand like the need to focus on economics because if people realize that it's all about economics and they're just being fooled so the bourgeoisie can just do whatever it wants a lot less people would accept fascists but also you have to understand that it goes into the darkest emotions in mankind where you have two options you either show solidarity or you take the breadcrumbs and you say well at least i'm not that and you use your whatever ethnic supremacy you've been given to allow you to follow in this path. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to connect it again to the Israeli case because I remember this. This is, was 20... Ah, oh, God, Habib. I think it was 2014. And this Haaretz columnist, and I remember this very clearly, she said that she was on this bus to Ilat or whatever the fuck, and she was sitting there. It was a long ride, two or three hours. And this guy, he was 19 years old. He was a soldier. And now for people who don't know, in the Israeli military, it has a draft system. For men, you have to do a service for three years that is basically for free. You get paid so little. Like, it's actually not even close to being a livable wage and a lot of it goes into this like savings account that they give to you when you get out of the army system so this guy was 19 he was i think a lonely child and he was with this journalist a columnist for hours and everything he complained about everything was economic so he was working minimum wage outside of his hours in the military so he can make money to give to his mom because her lights are being cut out because she's elderly. She doesn't have any means of sustenance. And so he was basically doing two jobs in the military, but then working a minimum wage job outside the military just to keep the lights on at his old home. And then she asked him, who are you going to vote for in the upcoming election? And she thought probably going to be somebody who talks about economics to whatever direction it may be. And then he said Marzel, which, by the way, Marzel is a guy who's like death for Arabs, just like he would make Ben Gvir sometimes look like an angel. This is a very extreme right wing Jewish politician, which his main issue is like, fuck the Arabs, death to the Arabs, kill Arabs. That's the only shtick that he has. I don't even think he talks about settlements. It's just like kill Arabs. That's it. And she was just blown away. And she asked him why Marza is like, he's going to fuck the Arabs most. Now, Marza did not end up winning any seats in that election, but it's just here to show how if you can make people hate another group of people so much, even when they complain, like it's not that they are not aware of their economic situation. That is what they do. It's the same thing that Republicans do in the United States. They make the poorest motherfuckers on the planet call for tax cuts when they pay no taxes at all, but they actually benefit from taxes. The same thing in a lot of these cases. It is about racism. It is about supremacy, but you cannot get supremacy economically, but you can get it just because you have a different skin color or a different ethnicity. And it is actually amazing how you can turn people's brains off and make them vote against their own self-interest over and over and over again. Now, how do you justify a person who's supposed to be a logical unit, according to a lot of this theory, how does he continue to vote against his own self-interest? That is insane, right? You have to give him something. And for me, it's the euphoria. 
And I always connect this to the issue of slavery. Only 8% of adult white males in the South own slaves. 8%. So statistically speaking, almost every person who died in the Civil War from the South was not even a slave owner. But why would a million people go and die to keep slaves for that 8%? I think what it is, is the fact that even though you are such in a shitty place, you take a lot of solace in knowing that there's someone who is way shittier than you. Someone that you can actually shit on. So instead of you and him uniting against your oppressor, you just shit on him and it makes you feel good for a little bit until you die of worms in your sewage. So it's like a false feeling of power. Yeah, this is the overseer. And I actually wrote about this in my feminist Marxism thing. Just like the male is the overseer between the female and capital, we see these structures of power everywhere. And in racism, it's very easy, right? You have the poor white guy hitting the slave and making the slave do the work to benefit the rich white guy. Now, the rich white guy never really dirties his own hands. He has a poor guy doing it. Here's the same thing. Who do you think goes and dies in these militant units in the Israeli army? I mean, units that are actually fighting combat units, not units that sit in a fucking office. Like, I don't know if the people know this, but in the Israeli lexicon, there's this word jobnik. It comes from the word job. And jobnik is basically a guy who has a job title, but he has nothing to do. And this is a very large group. It's like David Graeber's concept of bullshit jobs that just exist for the sake of having the job exist. Bullshit jobs, exactly. But this is for the draft, so this is the same thing as Donald Trump not going to Vietnam. If you're Ashkenazi, if you are from a more well-off family, or if you're smart, you know, statistically speaking, you're way more likely to be in either one of the units that are, are going to give you a very good education, like the 8,200 unit. They call it Shmoni Matayim, so 8,200. This unit is just basically you pass through an exam, and they teach you a lot of the tech thingies. And then after you leave the military service, you can get accepted in any company just based on the fact that you left this unit. And a lot of the Israeli tech sector is based on people who graduated from that unit. But if you're stupid, and what do you mean by stupid? I mean that you do not know how to do these complex math issues. Or if you're poor, or if you are from a subgroup in the ethnic hierarchy. So in the ethnic hierarchy in an Israeli society is obviously the Jews above the Palestinians, but that's simplifying it. There's a lot of subgroups in it, but like, let's talk about those who go to the army. So inside the Israeli Jewish racial hierarchy, you have the rich people first. But I think rich Ashkenazi people, usually it comes both. Then you get the rich who are Sephardic Jews. So these are Jews who mainly came from Arab countries at a later stage. They were very discriminated against. A lot of them are very poor. Yes, Mizrahi Jews, Sephardic Jews. In 1950, if I'm not mistaken, so two things. Number one, the Israeli Mossad actually bombed a lot of markets and places in Baghdad to scare the Iraqi Jews to flee to Israel and to prove that they are not safe with their Arab and Muslim brethren. We could and probably should do an entire episode about the role of European imperialism in Iraq and the Middle East North Africa region and its impact on the Jewish communities who called these lands their homes. The role of imperialism should be central in any historical account as it was deeply connected with the Zionist project, and therefore provoked an anti-Zionist reaction that unfortunately too often manifested in very real anti-Semitism. However, I'd like to add here that the major crime of the Kingdom of Iraq in this period was their Denaturalization Act, which let Iraqi Jews emigrate only if they renounced their citizenship, and thus the right of them and their descendants to return to the country of their ancestors. This law is still in effect. The other thing is when they came, they treated them as they were like fleas. They were actually sprayed with pesticides because they were thought like to be vermin. So you have that ethnic hierarchy within the Jewish community. You also have the difference between being secular and being an ultra-Orthodox Jew. So I have like religious, non-religious, different forms of religious. It's just like there's a lot of complexity to it. But you see it clearly. The poorest groups tend to be most right wing, especially on social issues, and they tend to show their hatred to Arabs the most. I think it's very connected. Would you say that the current Israeli regime is a fascist regime? And if you do think that, how would you say that this fascism actually plays out on the ground? Yeah, obviously it's a fascist state. So this is the weird thing about having a Jewish identity, which is ethnic and at the same time is religious. And this is a very big confusion. 
So you can become Jewish just by going through a religious process, but then your ethnicity is considered Jewish, which is very confusing. But this is, goes back to the fact that the Hebrew tribes who spoke Hebrew, but they had Jewish religion. And I think this is where the split goes apart. It has a supremacy system of different ethnicities and religions. I don't see any difference than being saying that the Aryan race is number one. And then you have all the other forms of white people. The honorary Aryans. Yeah, the honorary Aryans, whatever you want to call them. And then you have the Roma people. And then at the end, you had the Jews, right? Well, here's the same thing. It is an insane ethnic hierarchy. People joke about it all the time, but it's actually true. One of the beautiful examples about it is like I saw in 2015, I think there was a graph about hate speech online. So Arabs, 119,000. The second biggest group was LGBT, it was at 30,000. So obviously the struggle and the conflict takes place, like I would say the highest place. And that's where you see the disparity. And how do you see it on the ground? Land confiscations just actually killing people and facing no consequences at all. The idea that you discriminate if you are Palestinian and you have a connection to the land, you can never come back. But if you are like Ivanka Trump, just because she married Jared Kushner and she went through a process, she now has the right to come to my country to take someone's land. She's going to get housing. She's going to get education in Hebrew and so on and so forth. If you get a non-Jewish immigrant, that comes in to do a work, let's say like a poor person from the Philippines or Sri Lanka, they would not get any of that. So even you have different hierarchies among the refugees, among immigrants, let's say, legal immigrants, not talking about refugees in other words. So you have the Jewish immigrant, then you have the non-Jewish, non-Palestinian immigrant, and then you have the Palestinian immigrant. This is in terms of like legal immigration and how they treat you and what benefits you get. And then there's the fact that Israeli society is super racist against skin as well. You can see the videos, I am racist and I'm proud of it. Like that's the South Tel Aviv. They focus on Sudanese, Eritrean, Ethiopian refugees that came in and ran away from civil war and very harsh conditions. And just because of their skin color, they are super discriminated against. But again, Israel, just like everybody else, uses them as a force for labor. And the last thing is Palestinian. And this is something I wondered a long time. Like, why did they keep us? 48. Like, why would you keep these 150,000 people? Why not just kill all of us or make us go away? Because then it would have made life a lot easier for the Israelis. I thought maybe, you know, they want to have some good food. You know, just like in the UK, why do you keep immigrants? Yeah, because you're going to have them make some good food. So I thought about I didn't know. Then you grow up and you realize if you look at this oh we are basically the free labor now because of the war with gaza the israeli economics minister and the israeli agricultural minister announced a plan with vietnam the philippines and thailand and so on and so forth they want to bring 160,000 new immigrants to work in the fields and most of them are actually going to work in the services sector ethiopians and eritreans who work in kitchens in Tel Aviv, if they go away, a lot of these restaurateurs, they say, oh, your burger is going to be like 100 shekels. It's going to almost double in price because they have nobody to do these jobs for me. So it's a combination of all of these. It just reminds me almost of like an inverse of the Hebrew labor principle that was in early Zionism where they were like, we need to have a specifically Jewish economy so that we can strengthen our own settlements. Yeah. While they were actively excluding all non-Jewish workers. But now you have this established Jewish economy and they're willing to bring in cheap labor yeah. in order to really cement this idea almost of a labor aristocracy where you have the Jewish working yeah. class that is able to have its supremacy over the non-Jewish working class and has the privileges of being yeah. the dominant force within society. Actually, the best place to see that is you go to a factory in the West Bank, in the occupied West Bank. Well, the whole thing is occupied, but let's talk about the West Bank. So they have these industrial parks, they call them industrial zones, where you get tax incentives to build your factories. It actually incentivizes Israeli companies to move to the occupied territories because it's cheaper. But that's not the end of it. You go into the factory, every single employee on the floor is a Palestinian who doesn't have Israeli citizenship. So they are treated like shit. You know, their wages are way lower. They don't have a, a lot of the benefits. Sitting on top of their head, again, it's exactly the same thing in the American South. You have the African slave, 
And then overseeing him is not the rich white guy. No, 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 no. You have the poor white guy. And in the Israeli factories in the West Bank, you're going to find a Mizrahi Jew who speaks Arabic because he came from an Arab country and he's overseeing them. And the Palestinians hate his guts because he basically just rats them out to the owner of the factory who is Ashkenazi and you never see him on the floor. It just makes all the money. It is actually disgusting how the similarities exist. It is a racial hierarchy through and through that you base it on sometimes religion, sometimes on ethnicity or a combination of both. And you see people utilizing the Arab heritage because they came from Arab countries. They use the food. They love it. They celebrate it. But instead of actually making it sympathize with their Arab brethren, just because you're Jewish and I'm Christian or I'm Muslim, they look at it the other way and they are the most vocal racist you're going to find anywhere. It is actually amazing, this hierarchy that you find in almost any job in Israel. You're never going to find an Ashkenazi cleaning toilets. It's not a thing. It's either going to be an Arab, either going to be an immigrant from the Soviet republics, right? Or is it going to be an Ethiopian or an immigrant from Africa? These hierarchies are so significant and we see it clear. Thank you. I think You're that's welcome. really a good explanation to see how the economic factors really are connected to these racial hierarchies yeah. within a system. It's not even funny, Ben. No, of course not. It's like, it is so, do you know, I worked in Fatouche, okay, and it's a restaurant. We had dishwashers who were from the West Bank. Do you know what happens? They have a contractor that is like responsible. He picks them up and he's the one like handles their like visa stuff and everything. Do you know what their arrangement is? He takes two thirds of everything that they make. So they actually are paid more than I get paid as a waiter, but they end up getting way lower than the Israeli minimum wage. So the restaurant pays for a dishwashing person. Like he pays 60 shekels, 20 shekels go to the actual worker and 40 shekels would go to his contractor. So basically he's owned. So it's like overt wage slavery. Yes, but you know what is actually amazing? It pays off to do that because if you worked in the West Bank, you're probably be making less than half of that. So it actually pays off to be in such horrendous conditions inside of Israel in order to save money and send it to your family in the West Bank and have them survive. The same thing for those 18,000 workers from Gaza. If you come from a place where they have 70% unemployment and the money there is very scarce, for them, half the Israeli minimum wage is still something you can live on in Gaza. So it's actually, that's why they kept all the Palestinians. They kept us because we are a great source of cheap labor. It's like so many Israeli Jews would go to Arab towns only to buy stuff because it's cheaper, but they would never visit and never try to form a lot of the connections that are needed to start understanding the cost of what is happening. And also many of them just never enter an Arab town. So they don't know. They don't know the ghetto conditions, the refugee camp conditions that our towns operate by. So they are oblivious. And this is also like you talk about redlining in the United States, about having neighborhoods for whites only. 95% of Arabs and Jews in Israel live separately. You can actually go your whole life without meeting someone from a different ethnicity. One thing that I wanted to ask specifically about the question of your dissertation, I remember looking at this a few years ago. Is it true that the first police stations inside of Israeli Arab towns only were only established a few years ago, like 2017, 2018, or is that not correct? No, that is not correct. So there, we had the old police stations, some of them Ottoman, I think, but most of them from the British era. One is in Akka, which is a mixed town. There is another one in Lid, Ramli, both mixed towns, another one in Yaffa. But if we talk about Arab towns, there was one in Nazareth, the biggest Arab city. So it had the police station just being a big city. And then we had another one in Shfamir. I think this was in the 70s. And then after 2000, they started opening them up. The first one was in Emil Fahim, which was relatively a big city, but also it had the most active political resistance among most cities, Arab cities inside Israel. And then 2015 is when they decided this is what we're going to do. We're going to open police stations and we're going to claim this is because of increased violence. One point I would like to make is that if you look at government decisions related to that, up until 2015, no government decision discussed violence in Arab community. The one that actually authorized the opening of these police stations in 2003 was a direct response to the year 2000, where the Israeli police killed 13 Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel. This is Israel killing citizens of its own. 
It just happened to be that all of them were Arab Palestinians. The response of the Israeli government was like, you know what they need? They need more police stations in their own towns because that's going to help them trust us. By the way, zero people were convicted of the 13 killings that happened where we have independent reports. I believe one family actually hired a forensic institution from Switzerland or France, and they actually showed that their son, 17, he's an alumni from my high school, but didn't get to be an alumni. May he rest in peace. He was shot from zero distance with his hands behind his back. He was actually shackled. So they executed him. And the first time they used snipers against a uh, civilian population. And now they are actually, just before the war, the Israeli government was thinking of changing again protocols for opening fire to bring them back to the 2000 levels. Basically just enabling the killing of Palestinians, but this time they happen to be Israeli citizens. And I think this is actually proof about how you can never, 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 never appease this beast that wants to keep kicking more and more. Just now, they have different projects trying to confiscate lands of my village. They want to build a city next to my village. They want to build an airport next to my village. They want to build the water line next to my village. They want to build an electricity line next to my village. And they want to expand an interstate highway right next to my village. Mind you, we have nothing left. Today, Palestinians own about 8% of lands in Israel, Israeli land. Out of those, about 80% of Palestinians live in Arab municipalities. Those municipalities control 2.2% of the total land mass in Israel. And they are still confiscating lands from those municipalities. And this is 75 years after. Just this year, they tried to take 4,000 square kilometers from the Druze in the Golan Heights to build so-called green energy and build solar panels. I'm uh, sorry, wind farms. It never stops. And this is why I believe that every other solution except for resistance has been tried in the Palestinian case. And people talk about the West Bank, but I would argue that the Palestinians living within Israel are the way better case of how you can try and appease as much as you like. They're going to take and take and take and never stop taking. Thank you for that introduction in terms of thinking about how sure. the systems of oppression and racism and persecution extend across the land. I think obviously one of the reasons we're having this episode right now is because of the ongoing situation around Gaza. There has essentially been blanket coverage in the West. I don't listen yeah. to NPR, but like when I drive, I'll have my radio on NPR before I like plug my phone in to listen to music. And like every single day, yeah. the last week and a half, even at 1 a.m., NPR will be talking about Gaza and what's going on there. And the sort of blanket coverage, yeah. as well as pro-Israel bias of said coverage, is really hegemonic and really shaping a lot of the narratives that are coming out of this. And I think a lot of the narratives that are being created in this moment are completely ahistorical and seem to essentially give off the impression that history started on October 7th. But we know that's not the case. Here at the Jewish Diasporist, we stand for the universal values of peace, justice, and freedom of movement for all peoples, and oppose the senseless destruction and murder of non-combatants that always accompanies war. The roots of this decades-long conflict are often obscured, but lie in colonial history and the denial of Palestinian dignity and self-determination. As diasporists, we seek to foster alternative models of communal self-determination that transcend our modern world of nation-states. We believe that enduring peace will not come until true democracy exists for all who call Israel-Palestine their home. But because this escalation was begun by a Hamas attack, it has really given a sense of legitimacy to the current war, if we want to call it that. And because of that, a lot of the narratives and a lot of the pro-Israel crowd is really just able to say, well, Hamas started it, so everything that is happening to the Palestinians in Gaza is justified. Or if not everything is justified, it's all somehow Hamas's fault. I was wondering how you see this as you've studied this and lived within Israel and understand what's going on on the ground where you live. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about the sort of roots of the ongoing, I don't know if I want to call it conflict. It's a war. You could call it a war, sure. Although war is usual between two equal sides, I don't think there is any equality in terms of military power, at least. I feel disgusted every time I see this. Like, on the one hand, I'm happy that at least, like, nobody's forgetting what is happening in Gaza. But then on the other hand, I keep thinking about the fact that this year, up until October 7th, about 250 Palestinians died 
within the Palestinian territories, so Gaza and the West Bank, by the Israeli military. And just nobody talked about it. It just flows on. Nobody talks about it. Everything is fine. The second there are Israeli victims, as you said, 24-7, you open it at 1 a.m. on NPR in fucking California, you're going to be hearing about it. And this is part of the racism. This is the part that Palestinian lives doesn't matter, never matters. But an Israeli life, so important. I think it all boils down to the fact that Israel is looked at with a strategic importance in the West. And that is why they would do all these things. They do it because it benefits them. It's the same thing with Ukraine. There are so many different conflicts in the world nobody talks about. But the minute something is very convenient to focus on, they do. Again, a week before the conflict with Gaza started, the Azaris just ethnically cleansed 120,000 Armenians from the Gorno Karabakh. Nobody talked about it. Conflict journalism were talking about it. Leftists were talking about it. Armenia was talking about it. The Russians said there's nothing we can do. Probably they did a deal with Azerbaijan because of the war with Ukraine and they want to just surpass the sanctions. Did anybody send a fucking aircraft carrier to the Black Sea? See? Nobody did anything. Just sit there, right? I didn't see the British Prime Minister or the French President or the Chancellor of Germany or the American President taking a fucking plane and landing in Yerevan. Nobody did that. Why? Because their lives don't matter. Why? Because strategically, it doesn't make any sense. Geopolitically, whatever you want to call it. But here... I've never seen anything like this. The American president, the American foreign secretary were in the Israeli war cabinet. They were sitting in it. This is the level we're talking about. Like for me, like I've always been amazed of how much Israel gets to do shit. And I'm not talking about international law. I'm just talking about the United States, right? So this guy, Benjamin Netanyahu, went to the U.S. Congress and gave a speech without an invitation from the White House. No other leader on the face of earth, I think in history, got to do that. It is because it intertwines with the strategical interests of the United States and the West. It's a very tiny state of 10 million people, but somehow it gets to do things that not even Russia or China. If the Chinese president shows up in the U.S. Capitol, <laughs> oh my God, it's, it would never, it's just, we're laughing. It would never happen. The only guy who would do it would be an Israeli prime minister. It is actually amazing. But this is the thing. It actually gives you some kind of solace and condolence because you know you're up against the strongest military empire in the world and its allies. Even with the multipolar world and China's rising and all that stuff, it hasn't changed. For now, it still remains the same. And we see it by the fact of the actions of the United States in the past two weeks. You mentioned that essentially Palestinians have no other option but resistance. If you were on social media or paying attention or didn't have your head buried in the sand, you did see in response to the attack on October 7th a huge amount of grief and mourning because hundreds of people were massacred. True. And it created a situation that made it very hard to be a Jewish leftist because it's really hard to hold that grief and say, yeah, innocent people don't deserve to die, and then see a large part of the left, most of which I'd say are not Palestinian themselves, essentially saying, oh, Israel's a settler colony, therefore there's no such thing as an innocent person. They all deserve to die. It was justified. It made this huge schism, I think, that makes it really difficult for people to really be able to situate themselves as a Jewish leftist because it became hard for people to be on the left saying, actually, maybe we should be holding in this grief and letting people mourn. Though I'll be honest, my immediate reaction was fear, not just for people that were just killed, but for what was about to happen in Gaza, because it was immediate that, oh, the Israeli army is not going to let this go without reprisals. How do you see that in terms of trying to have a truly human rights-based approach to peace within Israel-Palestine and within the Middle East. One, why do you think resistance is the only option? And do you think resistance is synonymous with that sort of violent attack? So I'm going to split this into multiple stages of answer. So the first thing is I'm a person who is anti-violence. Like I always thought about it and I can never take a life. But then I'm also a realist and not even a realist. I live in the world. Let's say you are a Palestinian and you want to try and get to a solution. What do you want to do? Let's say, how about peaceful protest? Like, okay, peaceful protest. Let us look at peaceful protest history within the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. 
So when Palestinians who have Israeli citizenships, this is a very, very crucial and important fact. They protested in 76 and 77 because their lands were confiscated. Thousands of great kilometers were confiscated. They were shot. I think seven people were killed. And we still commemorate that till this day. In 2000, when we protested Ariel Sharon entering the Al-Aqsa Mosque and just no respect for the rights of worship of a holy place for Muslims, but also a very crucial national monument for many Palestinians. So I'm not Muslim, but I still care about the Al-Aqsa Mosque, just like a Muslim would do. And 13 of us were killed. 2018, for a year and three months, Palestinians protested at the Gaza border. This is an open-air concentration camp. Israel controls everything that comes in, comes out. They control when they work, they control what they drink, they control what they eat, they control the electricity, they control everything. They bomb them whenever they want. They protested. Hundreds of them died, and 36,000 were injured, including journalists. They also killed a nurse. They used snipers, and they attacked ambulances. Well, okay, we're not going to do a peaceful protest. That did not work. All right, what are we going to do? How about the international community? You know what happens when the Palestinians went to the ICC? anti-Semites attacks on Israel and Israel withdrew from the ICC. Even the United States threatened to put some sanctions on the ICC because of this. By the way, the United States has a law that if any U.S. personnel was taken to The Hague to be prosecuted for war crimes, the United States president is authorized without going to Congress to send U.S. forces to take The Hague. What are we talking about? The U.N.? that started this whole problem, what other international organizations are the Palestinians to go to? Because any time they go to the UNESCO, UNICEF, whatever, the Israelis are going to say you're an anti-Semite. They push for any of these measures to be discarded. And also, uh, they just leave the organization, whether it is UNICEF, ICC, whatever you want. Even more than that, they also change the Overton window. And this is a very important thing to say. George W. Bush and George H. W. Bush and Bill Clinton voted against Israel in the U.N. Security Council multiple times. Obama abstained once on a resolution that condemned both the Palestinians and the Israelis. He abstained. He didn't vote against. It was a resolution that had no enforceable mechanism. It was just saying, stop the settlements, stop the rocket attacks. And he was called an anti-Semite. This is the moving of the Overton window that Palestinians face when they try to go to the international community. They say, okay. Well, what if we try to appease them? What if we just work with the Israelis? Well, this is basically what Palestinians living in Israel have been trying to do. This is what the West Bank and the PA has been all about. Land confiscations have not stopped. Settlements have increased. Violence have not stopped. Arrests have not stopped. Killings have not stopped. And then I look at history. I understand that Zionism at the end of it is done by humans. And these humans are like any other human. If they are in a position to take and they profit from doing all these horrific things, and nothing is done to challenge them. This is the famous quote, power concedes nothing without demand. They keep doing it and doing it and doing it, just like, you know, with corporations, whatever, it is, it's the same thing with Zionism. They can keep taking and taking and taking until nothing is left. The only thing they fear is resistance. And I'm going to give you a good example. 2019, they tried to put metal detectors at the entrance of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. People protested and Hamas threatened to start getting involved militarily. They backed down. The PA has not been able to achieve anything for the Palestinian people except furthering the security cooperation with Israel and furthering the prosecution of the Palestinians. So if you're a Palestinian, you look at those two, there's only one side that got your results and not because they are magical, they have magical powers, but because the only thing that the Israelis would be actually fearful of is resistance. And that is it. And also, by the way, we made the mistake and we relied on Arab nations to do the work, but they didn't. Because why would they? They're not the ones who are dying. So we see Egypt and Jordan. Look at what 1,500 Hamas fighters did around the Gaza Strip in just one simple attack. It just shows the facade that if there was an actual united Arab front, the Israeli state would not last. It's a paper tiger. All the technologies and the fences and the anti-tunnel and the Iron Dome and all of those things, at the end of the day, when you have a population that has been left with nothing and it resists, it just cannot be stopped. I don't disagree with what you're saying. I think it's very rational to think about. I think it's a JFK quote where he basically says, those that make peaceful revolution impossible make violent revolution inevitable. And I think there's a lot of 
logic there. But at the same time, I question if fear is really something that is good for the Palestinian cause, because especially when you look at it from the Jewish perspective, even in diaspora, you do have a sense of our history that says Jews have been oppressed and persecuted for so long that, frankly, there's like a intergenerational trauma response yeah. that says, oh, we see Jews being murdered, we see Jews in danger and vulnerable, and it doesn't necessarily make us... I think it possibly even makes it harder for Jews to really have solidarity with Palestinians because when it's either Jewish lives or Palestinian lives... I understand what you say. You think it's counterproductive, basically, right? Yeah, it really could be counterproductive in the sense that it really strengthens the roots of Zionism because I would argue that the roots of Zionism historically is anti-Semitism because anti-Semitism the fear that Jews can't be safe where they live was the driving force that led Jews to feel the need to build a Jewish state in the first place. But here's the thing, Ben, yeah. let me tell you this. What you're saying sounds very, also very reasonable, but it just fails when you come to reality. We have ran this experiment multiple times. We have people who have given up. Voila, s'il vous plaît. And they never stopped taking stuff from them, even though they didn't threaten them with anything. Because Zionism is not about the fear for the Jewish life. I'm going to quote Basim Yusuf, and he said, I have never seen in my life an oppressed that besieges his oppressor and then bombs them 24-7. That is not a thing. The fact that the Israelis or even the Jews all around the world are going to be fearful when this one Hamas attack, it's just preposterous. You got aircraft carriers coming in. You got bombs and tanks and da 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 da, -da, -da, -da. It's just like at some point, it just becomes unreasonable. With all due respect, this is being like a fucking spoiled kid. Let me tell you about something. I remember every single conflict in Gaza. 2008, 2012, 2000, I remember them very clearly. Even 2006, do you know what the Israeli news reports on? They report on something called Nifgai Harada, which means patients with panic attacks. This is the level we are talking about. They would report that there were casualties of a Hamas rocket. There were panic attacks. This is the level we are talking about, the playing the victim. You cannot be the oppressor, the occupier, the person with the most guns, most weapons. You're stepping on their face with your foot. You're bombing them. It's like an elephant pressing on an ant and then saying, I'm being attacked. The proportionality is just non-existent. And again, I repeat, they tried everything else. They have two options. They either resist or they just wait there and die in their humiliation. Now, let me tell you, it is not an easy choice because it is scary. <laughs> it is scary. I protested in 2021, peaceful protest in Haifa, and it was one of the scariest experiences I've ever faced in my life. And it was just stun grenades and water can. How do you think I would live if I live in a place that I know there's a U.S. sophisticated bomb that can blow up a whole 18-story building that can fall on my fucking head in any second? How would I feel back then? Terrified. But here's the thing, they get nothing left to lose. And this is what they miss. When you're fighting people that have nothing left to lose, they're obviously going to choose to fight. And for many people, even when they told them, move to the south of the Gaza Strip, they said, well, can we return? And they said, we can't guarantee it. And so um, we're not going to leave. Because you know what a life of a refugee is? In the West Bank or even in Syria and Lebanon? Do you know that these Palestinian refugees, like, they were involved in conflicts within those countries. Then they were victims of other wars, and then they became refugees themselves. If you're a refugee in Syria, then, like, 65 years after, you became a refugee again, and you had to leave Syria because of the war with ISIS and the Syrian revolution. You have no place to call home. It is not easy being a refugee, running away for your life. And so I personally would have probably ran away. I could not have done it. But they have seen that you cannot keep running away from your problems. At some point, you're just going to have to stand up and fight. And just one last thing, the issue about those who make peaceful revolutions impossible, make violent revolutions inevitable. I don't think really you can have a peaceful revolution. Unless it's like in places where there's not really an actual power that is preventing you from it. But here, if you just go on your knees and you beg the Israelis for something, with all due respect, this is what you're going to get. This is the Arab middle finger. Nothing. Zlicht. Nada. You know why? Because that's the world we live in. Nothing. Nothing. From the weekend all the way to a fucking coffee machine in a break room to getting back your land. You're not going to get anything back. No right of return. Nothing. If you just keep begging, it's never going to happen. And mind you, after this, there are going to be a lot of Jews here in Israel. They're probably going to be very scared and they're going to leave. They have been leaving way before that because it's shit to live in here. It's not that great, honestly. And it's way shittier for me. But I know people who say if Netanyahu comes back to power, I'm leaving. I'm like, why? <laughs> like, why do you care?
as like oh Supreme Court and stuff. So it's just like no. I know some people think it's counterproductive, but I mean we've tried everything else for seventy five years. It hasn't been working. I think this is a good place to end the first part of our interview with Habib. Fear of anti-Semitism plays a very significant role within modern Jewish politics. Any movement that seeks to challenge Zionist hegemony within Jewish institutions must address this historically informed phenomena. My ancestors were lucky enough to have the freedom to leave their persecution in Eastern Europe and come to the United States. This freedom has become extremely rare in our modern world of nation states. As a diasporist, I believe that we must work within existing institutions and build new ones to develop communal self-determination across our diaspora and demand universal human freedom, justice, and equality to help fix our world. If we can build a collective voice in diaspora, we just might be able to make space for a plurinational future in the land of Palestine, Israel, that allows all those with personal and familial ties to the land, liberation from oppression, human dignity, and genuine communal self-determination. I hope you enjoyed this thought-provoking discussion, and keep an eye out this week for part two of our conversation. Till we're all free, you are not my enemy. In our pain and in our grief, border walls won't protect me.